do want to just ask right off the bat tonight, as we get started, before we actually dive into our next books and Old Testament survey, do you have any questions about things we've studied to this point? I know I usually, in this format, I just start teaching and I open up the fire hose and you just get blasted, but uh, uh, tonight I want to turn that around a little and I just thought, you know what, I should ask them if they have any questions. I rarely do that. So I want to be considerate and... Uh, if there's anything that we've covered to this point that you have a question about, feel free to ask, um, especially the last couple of lessons, Ezekiel and Daniel. I found them to be very rich studies personally, and uh, though I was familiar with Daniel more so already, um, I hate to say that it's time to move on from Daniel. It's one of those books where you just would wish you could stay there longer, right? And so we, uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, we'll go ahead and move on with our next topic, and that is the Minor Prophets. They are smaller books, but they have a major message. And this tells us that we are rounding the final turn on the home lap as far as heading for home or the finish line with Old Testament survey. We've come to the last section of books, and it's the Minor Prophets. By the way, don't look too carefully at this PowerPoint up here. You'll see that someone put Daniel with the Minor Prophets, that is not something I created. That was a mistake by someone um, as I got this off of Google Images. But we are coming to the Minor Prophets, and I do want to just say a few things about the Minor Prophets before we look at our next book of Hosea. Let's just have a little introduction to some background information on these Minor Prophets. There are 12 books that are part of the set of the Minor Prophets, from Hosea to Malachi. And that's only 67 chapters total, which is interesting because the book of Isaiah was 66, right? So this is just a little bit longer than the book of Isaiah or even Jeremiah when you look at sheer space and content of, of what's actually written. It covers about a 420-year span of Israel's history from about 840 down to 420. Malachi written last, around 420. And this covers the historical events, the major chronological markers that you should already know very well at this point in your thinking, as far as the Assyrian captivity for the nation of Israel in 722 BC, and then the Babylonian captivity to Judah in 586 BC, as well as covering the time of the return of the remnant under Zerubbabel in 538 BC. So those are the major historical events that are covered and the sweep and scope of the Minor Prophets. Likewise, these books, though they're called Minor Prophets, we shouldn't in our mind shift down as we think of them. Sometimes we may have a tendency to do that and think, well, they're minor and they're shorter, so therefore they're not as important. That is not true. You will see that though they are small in size, they are loud in terms of their message and very important just like the major prophets were. That's why oftentimes when you hear people teach a series on the minor prophets, they'll say major lessons from the minor prophets. And that's very well put. As we think of what the minor prophets teach us, they carry on the plan of God as far as God's dealings with Israel and for the world. There's prophetic foretelling in that respect. They tell us about the Savior. But I think... On the whole, as you look at them, what they really impress you with is the character of God. And we're going to see that tonight in several of our books, particularly the holiness of God. As we think of his character, he is absolutely pure. He is righteous and just. And you put all that together, and that tells us that we are serving a holy God. There's no stain of sin in him. In fact, we see throughout the scriptures that he is called the Holy One of Israel. In the book of Hosea, you see that in Hosea 11.9 and 11.12. And his holiness means that he is set apart from the rest of his creation. That's what the word holy means. We as saints in the church age are set apart in Christ. We're holy ones, positionally. And God is holy in the sense that you take all of his attributes, you put them together, and there's no one like him at all. He is completely unique and distinct, and therefore he is set apart. He is holy. 
And we should not profane him in our thinking by treating him in a common way like we do the rest of creation because he's not common. In fact, as you look at the prophets, you see in Isaiah chapter 6 where he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And what do the seraphim say regarding God in his presence? They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They repeat that three times. And you see that in Revelation chapter 4 as well with the angelic beings there. And this really comes out in the prophetic books, this understanding of God and his holiness. And I think in the modern evangelical church today, this is a truth that is sorely lacking in our understanding. But we need to remember who God is. Also, the sovereignty of God is emphasized, that he rules providentially in the universe. He's sovereign over the nation of Israel, as well as all the nations that are opposed to Israel. He's sovereign when it comes to sending his Messiah, his son, at the appointed time, the proper time, to establish his future kingdom and so forth. His kingdom rules over all we saw in the word of God previously. Likewise, we see the faithfulness of God throughout these books as he carries out his promises with absolute consistency, especially regarding that future kingdom on earth with the Messiah coming. He is faithful. And when you think of his attributes, you think of his truth, his veracity, you think of his immutability, that he, that he doesn't change, and you put that together, and it means he's faithful, he's reliable, he's trustworthy, therefore. We are not faithful, but he is. You also see the seriousness of sin throughout these prophets, especially you're going to see in Amos tonight, that it is just a lot of judgment And it tells us something, again, about the character of God being absolutely holy, that sin is not something that he toys with. It's not a plaything to God. He's not ambivalent towards it. He takes it very seriously. He abhors iniquity, but he, at the same time, loves the sinner, as we'll see in Hosea tonight, especially. Another truth we see repeated throughout the prophets is the need to turn to the Lord or return, sometimes it's translated, the particular Hebrew word, shub. And of course, the turning to God must be from the heart as a matter of faith, and when somebody repents or changes their mind, they have turned in their mind and heart to the Lord. And then the Lord wants the physical deeds of following him in righteousness to flow out of that heart turning to him. There's a lot of acknowledgement within the minor prophets about the sin of believers who have fallen away from the Lord or a covenanted nation that needs to turn to the Lord. And so this word turn or return pops up over and over and over again. Likewise, there's an emphasis on the mercy and loyal love of God in spite of Israel's sin. We're going to see this term that's translated sometimes mercy, sometimes love, or loving kindness. It's a key Hebrew word called hesed, and we'll get to that a little later. But that pops up over and over and over again. Why does God love Israel despite her being unlovely? Well, it's because of his character, that he is a loving God. He makes a covenant and a promise, therefore, and he sticks to it. That's just who he is by nature. And he's a merciful God, a gracious God. We also see the emphasis on worship throughout the minor prophets. That as we think of God for who he is, he is worthy of proper reverence and awe and respect that will cause us to praise him and give him thanks for his wonderful grace and mercy. It's like what Psalm 29 verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So these are some truths that are emphasized throughout the minor prophets, but some things that you also must keep in mind as we go through the minor prophets is the the role of the covenants as they pertain to a covenanted nation, namely Israel, and to just for a moment take your, your grace age church hat off, set it on the on the table where you're reading the Bible, 
and put on an Israel hat or set of glasses for a moment and just see the Old Testament from the standpoint of the people to whom it was directly written so that we don't read the New Testament and grace truths back into that context per se because we recognize they were a people that were under a different dispensation, namely law. And they were given covenants that we as a church were not given. And that's why the Bible does not teach covenant theology, where the church is Israel, or has become the new Israel, and therefore we've absorbed Israel's covenants. The Bible simply doesn't teach that. It teaches that the covenants were for Israel, like Romans 9, verses 3 through 5. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ, Paul says, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers, the patriarchs, that is, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all eternally blessed God. And so the church has not been given Israel's covenants. When God made a contract, he had a particular party in mind that he made that contract with. And just like contract law today, you don't change the party after the fact on the contract. Otherwise, it's a null and void contract. God doesn't put the church in Israel's place. So he will uphold his covenant promises. We see that throughout. And it's important to keep in mind that there are various covenants operating at the same time as you read these prophets. You see them appeal to the Abrahamic covenant, where God has promised Israel um, that he will bless them as a nation, multiply them, they will have a land that is their own, and so forth. And of course, the Messiah will come as a result of that from the lineage of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes of Jacob, Israel. But in addition to that, there's the Davidic covenant, where God promises a, a king of the lineage of David, the Messiah who will come. There's the land covenant, where he promises that uh, Israel will have their land perpetually at a point in time uh, in the future. There's also the new covenant, in which he promises to change them from within. And all of that's going to happen or be fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom. But in the meantime, Israel was under a Mosaic covenant, a different kind of covenant that was conditional, a works covenant. The other covenants were covenants of grace. They were unconditional. And, and when you read in covenants, you need to keep both sets and kinds of covenants in mind because they're operating back and forth throughout the Old Testament. That's why when God chastens the nation and he disciplines them, even to the point of death, it seems like he's rejecting them and pushing them away and saying, you're no longer my people. I'm done with you. Well, if he did that in totality and permanently, that would mean he broke his covenant back here. These grace covenants, like the Abrahamic, where he says he's gonna, they're going to be his people forever. Not because they're worthy. They never deserve to be his people in the first place. So what that shows us is that according to the Mosaic covenant, particular generation of Israelites may be chastened to the point of death and set aside. Just like the generation that refused to go into the promised land but didn't walk by faith, wanted to go back to Egypt, God says, I'm going to take you aside and use a different generation of Israelites to go into the promised land, and they'll inherit what I've promised. And you see that throughout Israel's history. He'll set a generation aside, but that doesn't mean he's broken his bigger promise. So you see the Mosaic Covenant operating, which is conditional, side by side with these long-range, unconditional covenant promises. And many people who don't understand dispensational truth, they don't see what's really happening in the Old Testament as far as God's covenantal dealings in that regard. So that's very important to keep in mind as we go forward. Now, with the Minor Prophets, I think I'll just give you the trigger words right up front, and we'll review these from time to time. Trigger word for Hosea is faithfulness. It's all about faithfulness, which we'll see tonight. God's faithfulness. 
and Gomer's and Israel's unfaithfulness. Joel, what is that about? It's about the day of the Lord. A time of God's judgment, followed by a time of God's blessing. Amos, it's actually two words, just like Joel was actually four words. I cheated a little here. I couldn't think of one particular word to summarize Joel or Amos, so I'm actually going to use more than one word, but I think these fit. Plumb line, and we'll get to that. Um, Amos was not an architect but or a construction worker, but he used the plumb line as an illustration. Obadiah is all about the nation of Edom and Edom's destruction. Jonah is about mercy. You know the story of Jonah. We'll get to that next time. But the main point is that God shows mercy to all people, not just his covenanted people, Israel. Likewise, the book of Micah is about justice. I was really tempted to call it Isaiah because it's like a miniature Isaiah. But in essence, it is about justice. It deals with God's true justice as well as issues like social justice. So those are the first six books. Nahum deals with a particular city, namely Nineveh. Remember that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites? Nahum has a message for the Ninevites as well, but it's a little different. The book of Habakkuk is about Habakkuk himself struggling with questions of why. Why are these things happening? Why isn't your righteousness being found in Israel and, and so forth. Why are, why are these bad things happening to us? And so it really it's a question not so much about doubt, but the bigger picture there is of faith. Zephaniah is about judgment. Now this one I struggled with as well because, frankly, a lot of these minor prophets deal pretty heavily with the subject of judgment. But I reserve that one term for this particular book because it deals a lot with the day of the Lord, just like Joel, but references the day of the Lord just a little bit less than Joel, so it still deals heavily with judgment. What is Haggai about? These last three books were post-exilic minor prophets. They had come back, was part of the remnant. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah were prophets who encouraged the people to rebuild the temple, and so Haggai is about rebuilding. And Zechariah is about preparation. Zechariah sees beyond just the temple to more long-range truth about Israel's future, preparing for the Messiah's coming. And then lastly, Malachi deals with, some say, backsliding. I think the real issue there is a matter of the heart. It was one more of apathy towards the Lord. They had come back, they'd gotten settled in the land, but they had become complacent not just in their deeds, but more importantly in their thinking and in their attitude towards the Lord. So there's your 12 trigger words for the 12 minor prophets, and we'll review these with each particular book that you study. So any questions about the minor prophets before we dive into Hosea here tonight? Okay. Well, let's move on to Hosea, or Hosea, as you would say in Hebrew. This is the longest of the minor prophets. Zechariah is also 14 chapters, just like Hosea, but Hosea is slightly longer in terms of overall content per word. What does Hosea deal with? It deals with God's faithfulness to an unfaithful nation, namely Israel. And the setting is primarily the 10 northern tribes as they are uh, being prepared for the judgment of the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C., that time is approaching within Hosea's own generation. It was very short and around the corner. Israel, in terms of its spiritual uh, walk with the Lord, was thoroughly corrupt. It was just absolutely spiritually bankrupt at this time. They had gone through centuries now of idolatry and apostasy, and there was just a rampant sin within Israel. And so God looks at the ten northern tribes of Israel and he views them, in essence, 
metaphorically as his wife who has gone away and committed infidelity. She is spiritually adulterous in a major way. So that's what Hosea is about. In Hosea, we see the heart and the holiness of God, that he's holy on the one hand, but he also is compassionate and merciful and loving on the other hand, very patient with his people. And the Lord uses the man, Hosea here, and his wife as an illustration of his own patience and love towards an unfaithful wife, namely Israel. You know, as you think of infidelity and even adultery within marriage, if you and I have had, in my 50 years now of life, had enough experience as a pastor, being in a local church, dealing with homes where and families where they have been affected by infidelity, it is absolutely the case that words cannot even adequately describe the grief and the wreckage that comes from infidelity. There's just tremendous emotion involved with, when a person comes to realize that their spouse has been cheating on them. There's a sense of betrayal. There's a sense of hurt, sometimes disgust, sometimes a sense of I've been deceived and I don't even know what is really true anymore. What is reality? There's a sense of personal rejection, feeling unloved, often confused. There's often a sense of loneliness and despair that sets in, sometimes a loss of sense of identity. And that's just for the spouse who's been cheated on. The effects of infidelity on a marriage itself are absolutely devastating. That's why it often ends in divorce. As the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 19, that there is grounds for divorce. There is the exception clause in those two chapters where he says, except for fornication, and the Greek word is pornea, and it speaks of sexual infidelity. Now that can be forgiven especially by the spouse who's been cheated on, the victim, so to speak. They can forgive the cheating spouse, but that doesn't mean they can always trust the cheating spouse. And that's why the Lord understands that sometimes, because of that distrust, that marriages dissolve. And he allows for that with that exception clause. And that is absolutely devastating, not just for the marriage relationship itself, but the effects it has on children, the effects it has on extended family, local churches, and many others. And so as you stop and you ponder the hurt and the fallout from infidelity, I think you can get a sense for what God is thinking as we read the book of Hosea. As he is the one who is cheated on by his spouse, his wife, so to speak, namely Israel. So this is what the book of Hosea is about. It's about a man and his wife, namely a real man, the prophet Hosea, with his wife, Gomer, who is unfaithful, all picturing God's relationship with Israel in a spiritual sense. And so we see some valuable lessons in this book about the character of God again, that he is a loving and patient, even forgiving God, but also a just God, we also see the depths of the depravity of the human spirit and soul with the infidelity of Israel. So let's begin by having an overview of this book, just to introduce this book with some basic information. The author of the book is Hosea, we assume, at least he is the prophet who is referred to in chapter 1, verse 1, and let's read that together. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. And remember, most of these prophets didn't write in the first person. It came to me, Hosea, etc. Though we saw Daniel do that a few times. Most of the time they referred to themselves in the third person. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, 
Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Right away we see there's some helpful background information there as to the timing of when this prophecy was given or the, this prophet ministered. But he's named here in verse 1 as Hosea. Hosea. It's very interesting that his name means Yahweh is salvation. And it's related to the terms for save or salvation. Yasha is the term in Hebrew for save. Yeshua is a form of Jesus in Hebrew, meaning a savior, one who delivers. Yahashua is the, the name Joshua, actually. And so Hosea is related to the term salvation. God is our salvation. Yahweh is our salvation. And you'll see here that the Lord is a savior to Israel throughout this book of Hosea wooing her back to himself in order to save her. And we're even going to see in Hosea chapter 3, verse 2, that there's a picture of Jesus Christ as the Redeemer, Israel's Savior and our Savior as well. Likewise, as we think of introductory information, we see here that the prophet Hosea's authority is expressed in this phrase that the word of the Lord came to Hosea. He didn't initiate this. He didn't come up with this content that's in this book. It came to him. And it wasn't his word. It was the Lord's word. And so this tells us about the authority that he speaks with in this book. We know that, of course, all the prophets were inspired of God and that the Holy Spirit gave the contents of each book. But it is also true that they spoke with conviction. These were men who would have preferred not to say what they had to say, but they were compelled by the Lord to say what they needed to say because God gave them their message. And that reminds us of a truth that when it comes to, even in this age of grace, teaching the word of God, if you are not fully convinced that what you're teaching is truth from the word of God, you shouldn't stand in a pulpit and teach others you must be fully convinced that what you're teaching is truth from God. Now, I'm not saying that you believe you're a prophet. Far from it. We're taking prophetic truth that's been revealed to others. But what we're teaching is based on that truth. And we need to be fully persuaded in our own mind as well. And so, therefore, have authority when we teach. That's why I like what 1 Peter 4, verse 11 says. Peter writes to the church, and he says, If anyone speaks... Let him speak as the oracles of God. And by the way, when you have that perspective, you will be more prone to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine because you're preaching the word, the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 says to do that. Do you realize the word that he's just referred to in 2 Timothy 4, 2 comes from the end of chapter 3? Where all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, etc. He's referring to scripture there. That's the word that is to be preached with authority, with practical application. That's why, as we've seen over and over again with these minor pro major prophets, we'll see it in the minor as well, they didn't just foretell in terms of future information. They were foretellers as well. They exhorted because the bottom line was, do we have a relationship with God? And the goal was not merely to give interesting information about the future, but to see people's lives transformed. And so that's what's going on with Hosea as well. The word of the Lord came to him, and it was truly a divine, authoritative message that he had received. We also see stated in verse 1 that his father's name was Beery, but nothing more is known of his ancestors. This is the only information we have about his background or lineage. So he was probably from Israel. We probably can deduce that safely from his book because 
He has a lot of personal, very f familiar acquaintance with the region of the ten northern, ten northern tribes and such. He probably was not from Judah. But that's about all we know about him personally. Some prophets give a little more background information, but not Hosea. One thing we see is that Hosea's role may have been that of a priest because he has a very high view of the duties and responsibilities of the priesthood, though he clearly functioned as a prophet. And in Israel, there were three main offices, not only of prophet and priest, but also of king. And the Lord Jesus occupied all three. When it comes to Hosea's ministry, it covered the span of five kings. It's good to have that information in verse 1, because that tells us when he would have ministered from approximately 755 to 710 B.C. That tells us that Amos was prophesying to Israel around that same time. Came a little, well, right around that same time. Hosea came a little after Amos. And then Isaiah and Micah would have been prophesying to the south in Judah. So it's not as though Hosea was the only prophet functioning at that time. Again, they had partners in ministry, so to speak. And I would not have been be surprised at all to find out one day that they knew of each other and found great encouragement from the ministries and writings of one another. By the way, let me go back to this point here. As you read the book of Hosea, keep in mind that this book was written by a man whose ministry spanned about um, 45 years there. He had a lengthy ministry. And so 14 chapters for a 45-year ministry doesn't seem like much. And that's why I think that this book is a composite probably of several messages that the Lord gave him over those four and a half decades or so. And uh, this should also be a clue to us about the spiritual conditions of Hosea's day, that this ministry covered a period of time leading up to 722 B.C. and the, the uh, captivity of the ten northern tribes. Now let's move on to the relationships we see expressed here in this book. Let's read verses 2 and 3. It says, When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry. You notice that word three times, harlotry? I think he's got a main point there, don't you? By departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. So what do we see here? We see that Hosea's wife's name was Gomer. She's the main character in this book. And then he's going to have three children with Gomer. First of all, he has a son with her, and the son's name was Jezreel, as we read on in verse 4. Verses 4 and 5, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. If you remember from your reading of the historical books, there was this man, Jehu, which seemed at times that he was a righteous man. The Lord certainly used him as an instrument to bring judgment to the unrighteous kings and even uh, Jezebel and, and Ahab and their house and so forth. But he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord either. So ultimately, he was not a righteous man. And so the Lord says, I want you, by the way, where was he situated? Up in Jezreel, which was in the north. That's where his kingdom and his, his uh, realm would have been. And so that's why the Lord says, call your son Jezreel, because I'm going to use your son as an object lesson to teach Israel that they are going to be destroyed brought to an end. So every time they hear the name of your son, it's going to be a reminder of why you named him that, because Jezreel is going to come to an end. 
But then he goes on, and he has a daughter named Lo Ruhama. Verse 6, and she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name Lo Ruhama. Notice it's God who is telling, wouldn't that be nice? Pray to God and say, what do you want me to name my kid? And he gives you the name. Now, you may not like the name he gives you, but you got your answer. So the Lord says, name her Lo Ruhama, which means literally, no mercy. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the hand, by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, or battle, by horses or horsemen. By the way, how was that fulfilled? Remember when the Assyrians came down and they were about to conquer Jerusalem? And Hezekiah and Isaiah got together and they prayed and they pleaded with the Lord. There's 185,000 outside of the walls of Jerusalem, and we're about to be capsized. And the dynasty of David and your promises, Lord, are about to be extinguished. We don't have an army that can stand up to this great army. What are we going to do? The Lord saved them. Because he had a purpose for Judah that he didn't have for the ten northern tribes. So that's how verse 7 was fulfilled. But at this point, we know that Judah was holding on a little longer in the plan of God, at least till 586. And so that's why it's stated the way it is in that passage. But here he says, no mercy. Can you imagine uh, growing up, you know, thanks mom and dad, my name is no mercy. Maybe she had wrestling matches with her bro two brothers and she was had them in chokeholds and showed no mercy. Maybe that's how she applied that. I'm just kidding. But can you imagine being given that name? that that would have been a preaching lesson right there every time somebody said, what's your name? No mercy. <laughs> Whoa, why did your parents name you that? Well, let me tell you. This is what the Lord told my dad, and that's why he named me this. Wow, what a powerful object lesson. Now here's another instance. Their third child, a son, verse 8, is named Lo Ami, not Lammy, but Lo Ami which means no people. Now when she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Wow, what a sad statement. After centuries of them being his people, he's going to put them away. Wow. Yet there is a message of restoration and hope as we read on. Verse 9, Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Notice he's always got his covenant promises to Israel that he's not going to break. He may set aside a generation or generations, but never indefinitely. So he goes on. Your descendants will be great in number, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land. For great will be the day of Jezreel. Say to your people, say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. So on the one hand, when God spanks, on the other hand, he comforts. And you see this back and forth throughout the prophets. Because that's the God we serve, a God who's just, but on the other hand, a God who's merciful or gracious. And so those are the significance of the prophet's name, children's names. Now, what is the significance as it pertains to uh, Jezreel? You know what? I already gave you all these answers. By the way, where was Jezreel? It was up there in the north. Hosea's message, we can summarize it thusly. It was to Israel, not to Judah, 
to Israel for the most part, which was also called Ephraim throughout this book. Why? Because that was the largest of the ten northern tribes. His message was of needed repentance in view of their ongoing adultery and apostasy in contrast to God's faithfulness and forgiveness. Let's uh, take a look at a couple passages here. Chapter 2, verse 13. Here we see God's chastening upon them. He says, I will punish her for the days of the Baals. Remember, those are the names of the false gods throughout the land. For the days of the Baals to which she burned incense, she decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot says the Lord. So she was unfaithful. Verses 14 through 20, though, speak of restoration again. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. The Lord is speaking here. I will win my wife back. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. By the way, that's a play on words because the word for my master is Baali. You'll no longer go after the Baals, but you will go after me as my husband, the Lord says. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. And I think he could be referring here to the new covenant in the millennial kingdom when he changes the relationship of nature to uh, his people and gives his people a new heart. Ezekiel 36. I will betroth you to me forever, verse 19. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Excellent verses there of great comfort. You see that God promises to restore as well as chasten. Now, what key terms or phrases are used throughout this book to convey these spiritual truths. Harlotry is a prominent word. Harlot or harlotry is found 17 times to speak of spiritual infidelity. The word turn, or sometimes translated return, is used 23 times in this book. And it's just simply the Hebrew word shuv, which means to turn. Love is a common word here 17 times. And this particular word for love, ahab, could be the love that Gomer had for her uh, partners that she cheated with. Sometimes it's used that way. Sometimes it's used in a positive sense, though, of the Lord's love for, for Israel. And so it's not inherently a bad or good term, per se. It can be used of genuine love or of unfaithfulness as well. But there's a more important term that's used than ahab, and it's the term chesed. And it's translated sometimes mercy, like in um, Psalm 23, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy, chesed, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, David writes. Sometimes it's translated loving kindness. And it's a difficult word to translate because it has a lot of truth packed into it. It's a whole concept. It's like a stick of dynamite every time you see it in the scriptures. To a Jew, under the covenants God had made with Israel, that was a precious term. Because it was a term that spoke of not just his love and mercy towards me, but of a loyal kind of love based on the covenants he had made with me. That's, that was the perspective of the Jew. 
It's kind of like in the New Testament where we have various terms for love and what is the strongest of them all. It's agape, right? It speaks of the kind of love that you do or give no matter what it costs you for the benefit of the other person. It's the kind of love that Jesus Christ expressed on the cross. And so hesed is very similar to that. And you see that six times used throughout the book, but uh, it's used sparingly, but it's potent when it's used. What's the trigger word for the book of Hosea? It's faithfulness. Faithfulness. On the one hand, it's God's faithfulness to Israel. On the other hand, it's Israel's unfaithfulness to him. Look at chapter 11 and verse 7. Here we see this concept of the heart of God and his loyal love for his people. Verse 7, my people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. Isn't that interesting? God says, though I, you're moving your lips, and you're going through a religious exercise, it doesn't mean you're really exalting me because I see in your heart. But notice verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Admon? How can I make you like Zeboam? Towns that were um, destroyed by God. He says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to push you away and let you go, even though you're cheating on me. And you see the heart of God. He's churning here. My heart churns within me, the Lord says. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror, he says. So you see in these verses the anguish of God. Think of it just like a a marriage relationship where your spouse is cheating on you. You love that person, but you hate what they've done. and You don't know if you can trust them. So on the one hand, you might be prone to let them go. On the other hand, you want to forgive and you want to stay with them. And and there's this anguish going on. That's the heart of God. Don't ever think that God is some stoic, distant God who's so utterly transcendent, he, he doesn't relate to us from day to day and feel the things we feel. He does. We see that right here in this passage. Now, as we think of the book of Hosea, and its structure. It's important to keep in mind that in chapters 1 through 3, it deals with the man, Hosea, with his wife, Gomer. And then in the following chapters, God uses that real-life situation as the illustration for his relationship with Israel in chapters 4 through 14. And now I think you can understand and appreciate this spiritual lesson of the book. Hosea's own faithfulness to his unfaithful wife who was involved in harlotry which reflects God's grief towards Israel's sin yet on the same hand other hand his loyal love towards his covenanted nation now what are some key verses in this book there are several look at chapter 4 with me 4, 6, and 14, 4 are your key verses. Let's look at them. Chapter 4, verse 6 is a very commonly quoted or cited passage. Let's actually begin in, in verse 1. Hosea 4, 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. What is his charge? There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. You know, when Paul writes to the Corinthians who were persistently carnal, he says to them in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, some of you do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. He's talking to genuine believers who didn't know the Lord. They were known by the Lord, they were saved, but they themselves didn't have a relationship with the Lord in terms of their walk with him. And and the Lord is saying this to Israel. Of all the people on the face of the earth who should know me, you don't. Why? 
because they were desiring to know other gods. Verse 2, by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. These were the manifestations of their infidelity and their apostasy. In verse 2, their various sins. What were the consequences of all this? Verse 3, therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Destruction and death are the result of sin, always. Verses 4 and 5. It says, no, Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest, which they shouldn't be doing. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. In other words, there's no light among the people. Their light had gone out because the knowledge of God had gone out. Now here's our key verse, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He's not talking about, you know, public universities not bestowing secular information. He's talking about knowledge of God. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Notice the knowledge here pertains to the knowledge of the word of God, the law. And why does he say here that you are no longer functioning as a priest? Because that nation, remember, in Exodus 19, verse 6, God said, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests for me, and I'm going to put you at the navel of the world where you can be my representatives to everyone around you. And so you're a priest the world. But see, when you leave me, and you abandon me, and you don't even know me or my word, how can you be my representative? You don't have a witness anymore. Your light has gone out, he says. No light, no testimony, therefore. Look at chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Here's how bad things had gotten, because they had turned away from the word of God. Verse 12, my people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. He says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. Why? Because they weren't ultimately responsible. It was the men who were leading, not in righteousness as they should have been, but in sin. For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Things had gotten so bad in Israel that a man's own wife and daughters were serving as, as prostitutes. And when he would go for the services, he would see his own wife or daughter there. How utterly shameful. How debased their culture had become. Just like the world of the Canaanites, whom God had sought to displace but that is how far they had sunk. Turn with me to chapter 14 next. Here's another key passage in this book. <clears throat> By the way, chapter 14 is read in Jewish synagogues each fall between the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, on the Sabbath. It's a very highly regarded chapter in Judaism. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, our idols. You are our gods. For you... For in you, the fatherless, 
finds mercy. Oh, aren't these just precious verses? How comforting. Verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him, from Israel. I will love him freely, not because he deserves it or earns it, because he doesn't. He deserves the opposite. We see grace here, don't we? Amazing grace. So those are the key verses and chapter of the book. Now let's look at an overview of the book in terms of its basic outline or structure. It's two parts, and by the way, I try to keep these simple, two, maybe three main parts to each book, because you know what? After you've had Old Testament survey, you're not going to remember all the subpoints and sections, are you? You're going to remember the main points. That's what I want you to, to do. And so Hosea is broken down into two main parts. Chapters 1 through 3 is the example of Hosea with his wife Gomer. Chapter 4 through 14 is about God's love for Israel. And as we break this down, you can see in chapters 1 and 2 the marriage between um, Hosea and Gomer. And then there's actually a remarriage in chapter 3. And I want you to look at that passage with me next. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So the Lord says to Hosea, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I sought her for myself. She had gone on a sensual binge, was probably gone from Hosea for a long time, and he may not have known where she was, but he is told, go get her. Go find her. And you'll even have to buy her back because she's become in bondage to her sin and to others. Verse 2, so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver. Remember, she never ceased to be his wife but he had to buy her back. And one and a half omers of barley. Isn't this amazing? Hosea had to purchase or redeem his own wife back after she had gone on an an adulterous binge and become the property of someone else in the process. Doesn't this picture for us the bondage that sin creates? It also reminds me of a, a situation I, I knew in Milwaukee of a family that had a son, and they were all believers, and the son got involved with some serious drug use and cocaine, among other drugs, and he just couldn't break away from it for decades. And so the mom would actually go down and deal with drug dealers down in Milwaukee. They knew her personally. It was always very dangerous. And she said, you know how many cars... I've turned over to drug dealers to get my son back. We're on our fifth car now. That was the price of redemption, to get her son back. But it just shows us again that sin has a cost. And you know, the beautiful part is, though, we have a redeemer and a savior. And though 15 shekels was nothing, in fact, that was the half the price of a slave, according to Exodus 21, verse 32. You know that? So Gomer wasn't even worth much, humanly speaking, back in the day, and yet the price was paid. And I'm so glad that the Lord doesn't look at us and say, ah, you're not worth it. I'm not going to pay the price for you to win you back. I'm so glad that we have in a Savior, a Redeemer, who by his blood purchased us to himself, the New Testament says, Acts 20. And so what I think we see here is that Hosea himself pictures the Lord Jesus Christ in a, in a way as being a redeemer, kind of like in the book of Ruth with Boaz as a kinsman redeemer. Here we have another picture of our redeemer and savior, Jesus Christ. So that's the overview of the book of, of Hosea. I do want to look at uh, some particular questions, key questions and other aspects about this book. 
You'll see about four of them there on your handout. The first one, how should we view God's command for Hosea back in chapter 1 to go take for yourself a wife of harlotry? Was the Lord telling Hosea, go find a woman who's currently committing adultery or fornication, maybe a temple prostitute, and marry her? No, I don't think that's what he was saying at all. Some, of course, look at this and just say, oh, it's all just one big allegory. Hosea didn't actually do any of this. He didn't have an actual wife named Gomer, and he didn't have literal children, etc., etc. That seems like it's pretty far-fetched, though, when you conclude that. Isn't it interesting that the previous prophets that we read, Isaiah in chapter 9, he was told to go marry a wife, and she was a prophetess too, and God had a spiritual point behind the wife that he was to marry. And that became an object lesson. Ezekiel the same in Ezekiel chapter 24. His wife becomes an object lesson of God's chastening or judgment upon Judah. And even Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16 is told, in your case, Jeremiah, I'm not allowing you to marry. I don't want you to bring a wife and kids through what's about to happen. So in each case, the marital status of these prophets became an object lesson to the nation of Israel. Why would it be any different for Hosea? In fact, it seems to be a very powerful, real spiritual lesson based on a real-life situation pictured in the prophet's own personal life. So no, I don't think that he was told to go marry a woman who was currently committing adultery I think what was more likely the case, and seems far more consistent with the rest of Scripture, is that he was told to go marry a woman, knowing that after you marry her, she is going to betray you. So Gomer would have done this after she was married to Hosea. Another question we need to address is, how does the book of Hosea emphasize knowing God and knowledge of his word? I, well, I underscored this already in Hosea chapter 4, where it says in 4.1, they did not have the knowledge of God. That's how it's stated. And in chapter 4, verse 6, it speaks of the fact that they had forgotten the law of your God, it says. Notice that God is always included in this knowledge. This isn't knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge in terms of a relationship with the person, the Lord. But just to show you how they had despised God's word, look at chapter 8. And look at verse 12. There's an amazing statement here in verse 12. Where the Lord says, I have written for him, Israel that is, the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. Wow. What a sad day in a believer's life when the Bible becomes something foreign to his thinking because it's been so neglected that it becomes a strange thing to him. I remember once in pastoral ministry talking to a couple who were believers who hadn't grown for years and they were having trouble with their kids and so I talked to them about child training. And I, and I quoted Proverbs 22 which says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And they looked at me and laughed. The wife laughed, and she said, I'm not going to train my kids. They're not dogs. And she utterly rejected my counsel. And I thought, how indicative of how you perceive the word of God in terms of the, its practical impact on your thinking. The knowledge of God was a problem. In fact, look at chapter 6 with me. Verse 1. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we might live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Let us know and let us pursue. Can I ask you, is there any pursuit in your Christian life? I know you've got this class now, an Old Testament survey, but I hope you're not treating it as an academic exercise, but rather as something, a 
means by which you are getting to know the Lord through this. And it takes a desire on your part, a pursuit to want to know him. Because again, though we may be saved and we may be known by the Lord, Galatians 4, 8 and 9 says, doesn't mean we actually know the Lord. Sometimes we use that expression as a synonym for, for getting saved. Well, when did you come to know the Lord? But you know the Bible more often uses the term know the Lord in terms of the Christian life after we're saved. I mentioned already the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Paul actually has to qualify when he's talking to the Galatians and say, you know, before you were saved, uh, now you have come to know God, or rather, he changes the expression, or rather are known by God because they were religiously, legalistically carnal as a church. So knowledge of God is a very important thing, and it starts with knowing his word. Now, how is 11.1 used in the New Testament? This is a very important verse that's used. Let's turn to Hosea 11, verse 1. It says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That is quoted in the New Testament in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 15, as something that was fulfilled, that's what Matthew says, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was taken so that he wouldn't be killed by Herod? He was taken down into Egypt for a time until Herod died, and then he was brought back. And then Matthew remembers this verse, and he applies it to Jesus Christ. So was Matthew saying that Hosea 11.1 1 didn't really apply to Israel, but it applied to Jesus Christ? Who is the son? Is it Israel, or is it Jesus Christ? I like what uh, one Jewish Christian scholar, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, had to say about this. He said, the example found in Matthew 2.15, which is a quotation of Hosea 11.1, 1, is an example, he says, of literal fulfillment plus typical fulfillment. However, the original context is not a prophecy. It's an historical state the event back in Hosea 11.1. 1. It is a reference to the Exodus when Israel, the national son of God, was brought out of Egypt. It is obvious that Hosea is thinking of literal Israel for in the following verses, he points out how Israel quickly slipped into idolatry. The literal meaning in the context of Hosea 11.1 1 is a reference to the Exodus. There is nothing in the New Testament that can change or reinterpret the meaning of Hosea 11.1, 1, nor does the New Testament deny the literal Exodus actually happened. However, Israel as the national son of God coming out of Egypt becomes a type of the individual son of God, the Messiah, coming out of Egypt. The passage is quoted not as a fulfillment of prophecy, since Hosea 11.1 1 was not a prophecy to begin with, but it's fulfilled as a type. Matthew does not deny, change, or reinterpret the original meaning. He understands it literally, but the literal Old Testament event becomes a type of a New Testament event. This is a literal plus typical fulfillment is the idea. Many of the citations in the book of Hebrews of Exodus and Leviticus fall into this category. And this is important because oftentimes, in fact, somebody just asked me this, a guy who's been coming out to church here in the last few months, who comes from a covenant reform background. And he said, don't you guys as dispensationalists sometimes read your New Testament theology back into the Old Testament and reinterpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament? And isn't that a big no-no? Isn't that a violation of literal interpretation? I said, no, it's not. In fact, I gave him this quote of this example um, a month or two ago, right here out of Hosea 11.1 1, with Matthew chapter 2, and this quote by Fruchtenbaum. So it's a use of the Old Testament as a type, not saying that it's denying the literal history of the Old Testament with the New Testament event. What important prophetic prediction is made in chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, and we'll close here with the book of Hosea. This is an astounding prophecy from the standpoint about 750 B.C. It 
Let's read. Something's not right here. I think that's supposed to say chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. That's a typo there. I thought, didn't we just read chapter 4, those same verses? (laughs) So chapter 3, look at verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim, Afterward, in other words, after many days without priesthood, sacrifice, or king, afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. This is a long range prophecy. He's saying Israel's about to be taken away into captivity by the Assyrians, they're not going to have a king. They're not going to have priests. They're not going to have sacrifices. And starting with the Assyrian captivity, we see Israel going away. 586, then we see Judah, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. They no more have a king or a temple or a sacrificial system while they're in Babylon. And so you see the times of the Gentiles there. That's a concept that we've discussed with other prophets to this point. And I think what all of this is is prophesying here is that it's not until the millennial kingdom that these things are going to be fulfilled that are prophesied here. Hosea speaks of a long drought, so to speak, where these things will be absent. And that's what we've seen in Israel's history. You know, they haven't offered animal sacrifices since 70 AD. It's a long time. And that's why there are many Jews in Israel who want to revive that system of worship. But what Hosea was speaking of here, I think definitely applies to this drought. But it will kick up again in the millennium, as we saw with our study in Ezekiel 40 through 48. So what do we see with the book of Hosea? It's an amazing book about the ravages of sin, idolatry, the unfaithfulness of man, but more importantly, the loyal love of our God, even pictured in the coming Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Any questions about Hosea? Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you again for your word. Great book much rich truth to apply in our own Christian life. And thank you for the God that you are that we see on the pages of this book. May we just relate to you as such a God, not under the covenants of Israel per se, but you are the same God who has the same loyal love towards us as well. And we thank you for your agape love demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ, our precious redeemer. We pray this now and we express this praise and thanksgiving to you in his name.